Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the afternoon session for um, the Inclusive Communication uh, Symposium. Uh, I'm Amy Shen. I'm the uh, provost at OIST. I also have been a professor um, at OIST for almost 10 years. And my research area is uh, in microfluidics, lab on chip devices, and uh, biotechnology. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, the two very special keynote speakers in the first session of, uh, in the, the first group of the, the, the session this afternoon. And so they're both from uh, HHMI. So for those of you who do not, this abbreviation, so it's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, based in, in the US. And so we have two speakers. The first speaker, so it's my great honor to welcome Dr. Laura Bonetta as a keynote speaker. So she's the Senior Director for the Biointeractive Program at HHMI, and she's also an adjunct professor of biology at Howard Community College. So her work embodies HHMI's mission of advancing science for humanity's benefits through biointeractive, so which leads the charge in making authentic science accessible to students and to researchers. And so by providing this really unique, high quality and narrative driven educational resources and professional development and uh, for life science instructors. And so this biointeractive uh, program really ensures that science teaching is engaging, inclusive, and also relevant across very diverse educational landscapes. So Laura's um, academic credentials include, so she had her graduate studies at University of Toronto. So I assume you're a Canadian? Toronto. Maybe. <laughs> and also she performed her postdoc research in London. And after which she actually made a, a, a major shift from um, uh, fundamental laboratory research to science communication, and which is very, very important. And her contribution as a writer and editor have influenced many high profile science journals and National Institute of uh, Health publications. So which shows the commitment, her commitment to utilize evidence-based science education communication to really impact the society in a positive manner. So Laura, welcome. We look forward uh, to your lecture. Um, thank you for, so much for that introduction, and thank you everyone for being here, um, and the folks who organized this symposium, and also wanted to thank my fellow presenters for your talks. I've learned a lot over these two days. So I'll be presenting, oh, and thank you Kathy Takayama for inviting, extending the invitation. It's my first time in Japan, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, so I'll be presenting with my colleague, uh, Vic Sivanathan. So the um, title of our presentation today is Inclusive Communication in the Science Classroom. And we will be telling you about two programs of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So what does, it, what does inclusive communication mean when we're talking about the classroom? So I'm assuming most of you have been have been in a science classroom, either as students or as teachers, at some point in your lives, maybe here or in another country. So in the United States, um, when a student goes to university, um, you have to select a major area of study. So it can be history, literature, science. If a student selects science as a major for their study, then you have to take the first year a lot of different science classes. So chemistry, math, and also biology. So introductory biology, and that's what we, Vic and I, think about. So the typical introductory biology class in the United States, it's usually two parts. There's a lecture part, which is 75% of the grade. So it's a bigger, it's worth more. And then the lab, so you do 
lab research, that's usually 25% of your grade. Now, if you're in a typical lecture, what happens in the lecture? So kind of what I'm doing now, the professor is standing in front of the class, you're all the students, and I'm telling you what I think you need to know, because I have all the knowledge. And so I don't even know what questions you have. You know, I might ask you questions just to test your knowledge, and then you're either right or wrong. In the lab, it's a bit different because I'm not talking as much, but I decide what you will do. You have to follow these steps, and that's how your lab experience. So it's very much one-way communication. So it's coming from me to you. So everything we heard the first day, and today that's not inclusive communication, right? When it's one way. So how do, why does that matter? We, if you're a scientist, you went through that process, you did fine. But what is the problem? So we know from a number of studies that have been done that when students, at least this is in the United States, students who enter, start university thinking, I want to graduate in a STEM major. So STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, or math. So all these sort of math, uh, science type uh, uh, subjects. So if students go to university saying, I want to major in STEM, only about between 30 and 40% of students will actually uh, graduate with a STEM course. And so most students will leave their major. They switch to another major. And that's even more true for students from uh, marginalized groups in science. So women, more, even more women, drop out of their STEM major in their first or second year of undergraduate. PEER stands for persons excluded because of their ethnicity and race. So in the United States, more black, Latina, and Native American students will drop out of their um, STEM major than non-PEER students. And then students who are first generation, so they're the first students in their family to go to college, more likely to drop out of STEM. Um, so, um, and the reasons that a lot of students, when they're asked why they changed majors, is that because the content in their biology class is not relevant, or in their STEM class, the classroom climate did not feel welcoming, and um, they had poor interaction with faculty. So as an educator, I have a lot of control over these things. I have a lot of control over the climate in my classroom and how I interact with my students. So that's kind of the good news if you teach. Um, so what does it take to change that experience so that students are not leaving STEM right at the beginning? These are students who want to pursue a STEM major. So it requires re-envisioning the role of educators, how we think of educators. Not so much as giving, you know, that my role is giving you knowledge, but engaging you in this two-way communication. So I'm going to show you a short video. Um, and Natalie, the first day, you talked about, <laughs> what? Uh, you talked about, how important awareness is. And I think as an educator, being aware of your identity and how you're interacting with students and why you're teaching and what you want to accomplish is really important. So in this video, you hear um, faculty talking about some of these questions, how they want to be um, teaching. Teach. If I give you 10 seconds to finish the statement, I teach because, what would come up for you? What would you think? What would you write? How will you be intentional in your spaces? How will you cultivate social belonging? Are you teaching to test or teaching to transform? Until you have to think about it, you don't think about <laughs> it. Think about it, yeah. You mentioned instructors can be keystone species, right? We can have these really 
powerful and disproportionate impacts on students. And that's that's the beauty, that's the joy of being an instructor and, and what makes it so fulfilling. Looking through your curriculum, look at your classroom, look at the experience that you are cultivating for your students. Where and when are you creating opportunities for your students to engage meaningful dialogue? How can I, as the instructor, guide and leverage students' motivation to be able to engage in deep learning process that allows them to be successful in your course and beyond? I tell my students the universe is not stingy with talent. It's spread everywhere, and so it is our, our job, our responsibility to develop that talent. The goal, the place that we're trying to go, is that quadrant of high expectations and high support. Um, and that's the place where we want to live. So what does promote belonging in school? The number one factor is a student's relationship with the teacher. There are so, so many ways that we can take action to make that happen. And I apologize, there was a bit of a lag with the video, but this clip is taken from a course, an online course, that the group I'm part of at HHMI by Interactive has developed for inclusive teaching. So um, hearing these um, different instructors teach, uh, uh, talk about what inclusive teaching means and then reflecting on how you want to this experience to be. So this is the first step, really thinking about what do I want, how do I create spa spaces for conversation in my classroom, how do I want to engage with my students, but then you need tools and strategies, you know, how do I actually put it in practice and so that's where these two programs that we will talk about today come in. So there are two programs at HHMI, Biointeractive program, which I lead, and the C, which stands for Science Education Alliance program with, that Vic leads. And they provide two approaches to um, creating a more inclusive classroom. Biointeractive is more focused on the lecture part of class, which is the more important one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and C is more focused on the lab part of the introductory biology experience. So we're both focused on introductory biology specifically. Um, so Biointeractive provides, supports educators by providing resources and professional development. So resources are anything you will use in the classroom. So they're all available on the Biointeractive website. If you go to biointeractive.org, there are about over 500 resources, meaning videos, um, simulations, activities, things that you can use in your classroom. And they're all activities that engage students in doing some of the things that scientists do, right? Asking questions, interpreting evidence, constructing explanations. So students are building their own knowledge rather than just listening to someone speak. And we also provide professional development, like the course I showed before, for educators to, um, to, pr to provide strategies for creating inclusive spaces in their classrooms. So this is a, just a quote from a teacher in Mexico. She says, using biointeractive resources, I have seen my students become amazed recognize the importance of scientific work, want to study tuskless elephants and find a cure for cancer. Um, so we produce resources for a US audience. That's our primary audience, but they're used internationally. Um, and most of our resources we also translate in Spanish. So I'm gonna show you just a little bit, like a snippet what it, of what it looks like to use these resources in the classroom. This is another video, hopefully it won't lag, but it's about tuskless elephants, what this teacher was talking about. So I'm teaching biology, so I get a video from Biointeractive, and I'm going to show students a clip from it. For over 40 years, Joyce Poole has been studying elephant populations in Africa. She's one of the world's experts on elephant behavior and communication. 
Her work has taken her to Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, where she's working with local scientists. Oh, the big guy is coming out, right? He's the same guy anyway on the camera traps who was in the farms. I'm studying the status of the Gorongosa elephants, looking at how they have and are recovering from a period of, of heavy poaching. The scientists are monitoring a peculiar characteristic, one that they have also seen in other African parks. Some elephant populations seem to be missing their tusks. So, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> Um, so if I, you were in my class now as students, I would say, you know, work in small groups, come up with some, what are some questions that you have? What do you think is going on here? Um, so you can talk amongst yourselves and then tell me, or you write your questions on a piece of paper, bring them, we can put them all on the board. Or like what Kana uh, showed yesterday or today with the polls, you use a poll to send in your questions, right? So, because most people will, have some questions after watching this um, clip. So I'm going to show you now students. These are actual questions from students, not from my class, another class. Students have a lot of questions. You don't have to read them all. I'm just showing you. A lot, they'll generate a lot of questions. And go, they, the questions are very varied. They'll talk about, ask questions about genetics, evolution, conservation. So. Um, in a lot of different areas. So already I've heard from my students. So part of this is engaging students. Now students are motivated to find out more. And also, it's good for me as an instructor, because now I know where students' perspectives are, what they're thinking about, what their knowledge is. So they're contributing their knowledge. And also, I don't know the answers for some of these questions. So it changes the dynamics. I'm not the experts who know who, the expert who knows everything. Sometimes students more know more of me, more than me about some of these topics. So then I may say, okay, is this evolution? It's a good question. What do we know about evolution? Evolution is change over time. Are these elephants changing? So then on Biointeractive, there are many other activities then that we can take advantage of to, um, to explore these questions. So this is um, an interactive where you can look at data. And there's a data set of elephants of different ages. And so you can start asking questions. Are there differences among elephants, maybe among, uh, based on the sex or based on their age, and visualize the data? Um, so students, and then there are other activities. So if you want to know more about genetics, there are other activities get it, that get into that. So students are now constructing their own learning by asking these questions and uh, analyzing data. And so we know that this way of students doing, asking questions and constructing their own explanation works. There's a lot of um, evidence in science education that this is way of active learning is a much better way to learn, especially for students from marginalized groups. And it's also the way that teachers want to teach. So when we ask, this is from a survey of 500 undergraduate educators who te teach introductory biology. And when we ask, what is the most important thing to you why do you teach? Um, so the top responses are, I want to help my students learn how to learn. And then almost everyone, 97%, says I want to develop my students' critical thinking skills, and I want to help my students understand how science works. This is what teachers, what faculty say. You don't get at this if you're just talking to your students. Right, that students have to be engaged. And so then, um, I think this is why a majority of US educators also use biointeractive resources, because we're providing 
these resources that allow them. It takes a long time to produce resources where you can engage students if you have to design them. Anyone who teaches, I see, it just take, can eat up a lot of your time. So having resources that are ready helps you achieve this. So we know we did a big survey of over 1,000 educators. Some were high school biology teachers, some undergraduate, and 79% high school biology teachers said they use biointeractive resources, over 60% of undergraduate educators use by interactive. So there's a need for these kinds of resources. And a cool thing that's happening now is these educators who are using by interactive resources and engaging students in this kind of learning are becoming agents of change. So what I mean by that is um, as classroom educators use um, these resources to create more inclusive evidence-based uh, teaching. Uh, we call them biointeractive ambassadors because then they're the ones who, who conduct workshops and talk with other educators about how to implement this kind of teaching. And that's kind of how it spreads, um, this way of teaching. So this is pretty much biointeractive in a nutshell. And now I'm going to hand it over to Vic, who can tell you about the C program. Vic, I don't know how to introduce you. That's me. I can say my name. Vic is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Laura. Um, I too want to, oh, sorry, I'm Vic Sivanathan. Um, and I too want to take an opportunity to thank the organizers for what has been a, a, a really um, a, a journey of learning here. Um, I've also had the pleasure of working with CHUB director Kathy Takayama in the past. She has always been inspiring, and so it's no surprise that we have such an amazing uh, collection of folks in this room. And so uh, thank you, Kathy. So Laura talked about um, how the biointeractive program is transforming the lecture component of the US undergraduate um, biology classroom, the undergraduate science classroom. The Science Education Alliance program, or the C program, is a sister program to BioInteractive, and we're trying to transform the lab component, right? So, you know, a common goal for both of us is trying to create spaces for rich interactions to happen between the student and the instructor, right? We think it's foundational for an engaging curriculum, but also foundational to create a sense of belonging in that classroom and a sense of belonging in the sciences, right? Kathy said Ubuntu, she reminded us, right? We are because we belong. And so the approach that the Science Education, oh, sorry. The approach that the Science Education Alliance is taking um, to achieve this goal is to transform the traditional lab course into a real research environment. And so, to sort of walk you through why we've taken this approach, I'm going to show you what a typical lab course looks like. You're all probably familiar with this. And then let's contrast that with what it's like for an undergraduate student to learn science through authentic research. And for the purposes of this talk, we'll focus on the interactions that happen between the instructor and the student. <coughs> and so I'll start with the traditional lab. Um, in the US, we call these labs um, canned labs, like a can of tuna. You know what's inside, you know what it looks like, you know what it tastes like, right? And so the instructor knows exactly how the experiment is going to go, right? And so when they teach their students, they're able to provide very clear guidance, right? Here's your protocol, here's how you'll do it, and if you do it right, here's the result that you would get, right? Now it's the students then. They get a chance to try their hands at the protocols, get a result, and then they turn that result back into the instructor who looks at it and says, oh, you didn't do it quite right, or you did it great, and then they give you a grade and they hand it back to you. So there is somewhat of a two-way communication here, but it's only one at a time, right? It's fairly structured, it's rigid, and really somewhat transactional between them. Let's explore what happens, or what it looks like, when a student gets, student gets to learn science by doing research, right? 
And so it starts off pretty much the same. The instructor still has to provide the protocol and explain to the students how they need to do it. But as they provide the students this protocol, they also provide context for the student, right? So they tell the students, you're doing this because we, want, we don't understand this thing in science and your bit of data is gonna contribute towards this. So be thoughtful about how you do the experiment because other scientists are gonna be looking and trying to understand it, right? Make sure you keep good records of it. And so the student is still going to be thoughtful about their experiment regardless, right? It still matters for a grade. But now that slight, very slight shift in framing changes the experience for the student because they're also thoughtful about it because they're contributing to a scientific endeavor. They're actually now, there's a, a burgeoning sense that you belong or you're part of something bigger than that classroom, right? So right off the bat, there's a slight change in framing for the students. Okay, so then the students go ahead and start producing results. And this is real research. We don't really know what the outcome should be. And you all do research, or many of you, sorry, do research, and so you know that the results are almost never black or white. They're never clear cut, right? They're always ambiguous. As scientists, our job is to sort of look for clues to decipher that ambiguous result so we can move that research forward. But students don't know this to be the nature of science. That's not how science education has been for them. It's always clear cut. So in this space, it's actually really hard for them to contend with an ambiguous result, right? You'll hear them say things like, the experiment failed. Or worse, they failed, right? Okay, but in this um, space of <laughs> ambiguous results is where things really start to shift between the traditional lab and the research-based classroom, right? Right off the bat, when the student has this ambiguous result, the instructor and student now find themselves on the same side, right? Because they kind of have to figure this out in order to take the next step. I can't just give you a grade for this, right? And so as the instructor and students are assessing and discussing that result, we see like magic happen, right? There's a whole suite of interactions that sort of blossom from that space. You can put them into two buckets. At the top, we have what we call conceptual facilitation. The instructor is really trying to help the student figure out what's going on, right? So they might say things like, well, let's, let's look at the procedures. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe I gave you the wrong materials. Let's look at that. They pull in other students and say, well, if many other students are using this, we can use that as data points, right? And they're modeling scientific thinking right there and then, right? The student is getting real-time feedback as that is happening. It's a conversation that they're having about that result. At that same time, there's this whole bottom set of interactions that are happening. We call this sort of emotional facilitation, right? You all know what it's like to get a bad result or, or an ambiguous result, right? So these students feel deflated, right? They, um, they have now lost some confidence in their own ability to do this. And so these instructors naturally find themselves saying things like, don't worry, I've been doing this for 20 years and I make the same mistakes, right? Or, um, you know, the first part of your experiment looks really good, right? Just apply that same process to the rest of it and I'm sure we'll figure this out, right? So there's some emotional facilitation going on in that classroom already. And you know, doesn't matter how small the result is, once you've gone through that process and worked hard at it, I mean, you clone a plasmid and it finally works if you struggled, this genuine joy that is, that is shared both by the instructor and student, right? And so I hope you can see that just by engaging in real research, we can actually start to change the dynamics, the interactions between the instructor and the student, right? Um, we go from a somewhat rigid transactional interaction to one that is rich with facilitation, right? And this changes the relationship between the instructor and the student. It's not just an expert and a novice, right? Now there's a mentor and mentee in that classroom. And so when we look at the experience for students and we measure things that are known to influence a student's decision of whether or not to stay in the sciences, whether they have ownership of what they're learning, 
Self-efficacy is their belief in their ability to actually be a scientist, whether they identify as a scientist. These are all factors that we know will influence a student's decision of whether or not to stay in the sciences. And so we see that students that participate in this research-based curriculum have higher, um, score higher in these categories than students who take the traditional lab. And what's pretty amazing here is we see no differences anymore between um, the student demographics, right? Male and female, peer, non-peer, first generation, continuing education. Now you've even the playing field for students because they work together towards success instead of deciding whether or not you're successful right off the bat. Now, if Catherine Ignazio from this morning was here, she's like, Vic, this is just rational data. Where's that emotional piece? We're talking about a sense of belonging, right? And so here, here, <laughs> here's that piece. So um, we bring students in to share their results. And so this is a first year student at a small community college in Texas. Um, where there's no research on campus except this course. And after she presented her data, she goes off script, right? And let's listen to her. Um, when I first started in the biotechnology program, it was a class to get to another class, to get to another class, right? A grade. And um, maybe you guys felt the same way at first, but I will tell you the very first day that changed. I knew I would love this. I had the most dorky smile on my face. Um, and so going through the uh, discovery process was really uh, empowering for me. Um, and one day, our professor dropped the word scientist, right? And I think Vic may have mentioned something like this. Uh, you know, our work, I guess what I'm trying to say is that day made me realize that what we're doing here is important. But my program, my research, our research, isn't any important, more important than your research or your research or your research. While some of the projects <clears throat> may be more uh, immediately impactful. Um, it, I just want you guys to know that I'm really proud to be a part of this community. And I hope that you guys are proud to be labeled as scientists. Um, and I'm really excited to add our data point of Megalion to a list of millions and billions or 5,000 projects um, so that we can at, at some point use all this data and progress this field. Right, and so, you know, this student, Danielle, she feels like a scientist, right? She has self-efficacy. She feels like she belongs to that community. Oh, I get emotional whenever I hear it speak, and I've seen this video a hundred times. Um, but Ubuntu. We are because we belong, right? It's right there in her, in her own words. Okay, so we know this is impactful for students, right? But we also know, we've also learned that it's impactful for the educators, right? Laura mentioned this. We've surveyed our instructors too who teach the lab components. They're often the same people, right? And we asked them, what do you want to be for your student? What are important roles that you want to embody for your students? And they say such wonderful things, right? I want to be their mentor. I want to be their collaborator. I want to be their motivator. I want to be their advocate, right? All these beautiful things. And then we think about that two different classroom environments. It's really hard. You can, but it's really hard for these sort of this roles to emerge naturally in that fairly transactional interaction that you have with your student. But you put ambiguity and authentic research in the classroom, and it emerges naturally. We provide no professional development for our te teachers to teach. We just give them the space to work with their students, and now that they can, that they can fulfill these roles. And they find this, for themselves, a professionally rewarding way to teach. Right? So one of, this one came in recently. An educator was retiring, <laughs> and they sent an email and said, that their ability to teach this way was at the pinnacle of their academic career. Okay, so the question then is, how do we transform the undergraduate teaching lab into a real research environment, right? So you all know research labs to be sort of tucked away, small groups led by a principal investigator, some staff scientists, maybe some postdocs, maybe some graduate students, right? 
undergraduate students, unless it's sort of an outreach or a summer internship, are not part of this equation. We don't have capacity for them, uh, for all of them in our classrooms, right? Um, right? So the undergraduate students, in fact, the, the instructors who teach undergraduate uh, students are separated at institutions of higher education. They are in a different bucket. Everyone else learns science by doing science. Undergraduate students and their instructors, who are primarily undergraduate teaching instructors, are sort of separated right there in, at the institutions of higher education. And so here's where the Science Education Alliance uh, sits. We sort of act as the connective tissue between the research lab and the teaching lab, right? So we work closely with research scientists develop protocols and resources, and then we turn that around, and we work with these instructors, these educators, who are all, like us, at one point took a bachelor's in science, or a master's in science, or a PhD, or a postdoc. We did it because we love science, and we went into teaching because we love teaching, right? So these guys are already primed to do it. So we pivot, we work with them, and support them to use these resources and do research with their students. As they produce results, we bring those, we help curate that data, we bring them together to discuss it, and then they feed it back into the research lab. They take that data, they innovate, and then they push the data back into the classroom, and then it keeps going back and forth, right? So this program was started about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, it's a program in discovering new viruses that infect bacteria, bacteriophages. So this program is called C-phages. In the 15 years, these undergraduate students and their instructors have built what is now the largest virus archive in the world. And there are viruses today that are in patients who are dying from anti, uh, sorry, antibiotic resistant infections, right? So it's not just beneficial for undergraduates, it's not just beneficial for the educators, it's also beneficial for science when we can expand the research ecosystem to be inclusive of, uh, of students. And um, because of this buy-in, we've been able to grow the program. Um, you know, we are trying to be a pilot to show what this can look like. Right now, we have about 400 educators across 200 colleges and universities in the US, from some of our biggest research universities to some of our smallest uh, community colleges in the US. And as Lara mentioned, um, what's really amazing that, we're, that we didn't really plan for is that these educators are now the ones that are championing this work. They are the ones going out and spreading this form of teaching. And so for HHMI, through the biointeractive and the C programs, you know, we are trying to transform the lecture and lab, the introductory science courses, to uplift the student voice and to center the student experience. And we've been able to make you know, broad and I think deep impact by supporting these educators as communities so that they can lean on each other. They feel part of the scientific ecosystem and we also provide them with high quality teaching resources so that they can focus on mentoring their students through the process of science and share with them the thrill of discovery, why we all do science, right? Um, we write, so BioInteractive and C have been staying in our separate lanes, working in the lecture and lab, but now we're sort of integrating our approaches to combine those spaces and approaches for what we think would be fairly transformative for US undergraduate science education. And so with that, um, I'll stop. Um, and thank you all for your time. Um, arigato Thank you. I realized I, I actually didn't get the to be I because I didn't want to break the flow. So let me just quickly summarize yeah. this uh, yeah. uh, background. I think that's uh, really interesting. So, um, so uh, as you all know, so Vic uh, has been working at uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and and he has a very interesting you know, scientific background. So, like, uh, so he majored in biochemistry and bi microbiology. 
from the University of Oxford and like Harvard University. Um, so he has been using his research to inspire college students, then demonstrating his uh, serious commitment to a better science uh, education. And uh, so this is, yeah, uh, so his efforts uh, with this program have enabled over 200 institutions across the US and beyond to really embed research into early uh, and right stop mentioning the inclusion of both. So at first, actually, so Kathy talking about this program last year at Barton, so so we have been thinking about how can we translate this with um, your practice, uh, so being too voiced. And so we have um, some potential ideas with our ETNA projects and so on to engage, not the college students, they know stuff. So. Okay. You know, you know, you know. So with that, I think I would like to open the floor for the oh, Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for two amazing talks. Um, I want to build the you right off what, you say, uh, what Amy said and ask, so I see from your website you have a Spanish version um, of Bioran Interactive and I wonder whether it might be, or how how feasible you think it might be to translate it into Japanese. Um, and OIST is a great place. You have a, an innovative group, like the innovation group. We have translators, programmers. So I think it could be possible. Yeah, so we have no, um, so occasionally we get uh, requests for translating and it's very easy for us to. So all everything we produce is for free. It's. Creative Commons, anyone can take our resources and modify them, except for the films. Those are the harder ones, but everything else is, so for us, it's just a matter of partnering because we it's work, right, to translate things. And um, But if, yeah, if we find partners who are interested in translating our resources, it's, yeah, it's not hard to do. So if I may, um, kind of trying to lift this above the, the, the classroom and into more generally uh, science communication, because I see a lot of the, the, the kind of the principles driving this change within the classroom could also probably um, be used as tools to make science communication more generally more inclusive. So inviting general audiences to kind of take on the role as scientists and kind of embrace that ambiguity that is in science because I think a lot uh, a lot of the time in in, um, in kind of uh, general audience uh, science communication it's very much an expert talking to uh, to, um, to to the people uh, and it's very they're very transactional and of course you don't see the audience but nevertheless the, the feeling is still the same that there are these experts in, in institutions and they do some special things and then suddenly science um, but also I'm wondering there is always a risk when you make things more dia dialogic or more uh, less transactional that, and, and you allow for this ambiguity that there's, you know, there can be faulty assumptions kind of arising and fact checking the general audience is a lot more difficult than doing in a classroom where you have an, uh, an interaction with, with students directly. So I kind of just wanted to kind of peek out your, your, your thoughts on, on taking these principles and applying them more broadly to, to the world of science outside of the institutions. We have a lot to say about this, but uh, why don't you go first, Laura? Um. Well, I think it's part of the, 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 we're part of a department that is actually thinking a lot about that because there are programs at HHMI that support scientists at different stages of their careers. And now there's a realization of the importance of scientists to engage with communities but not, again, as you said, and I think our vice president will say, don't drop a scientist like, in a, any community and say, here, I'm gonna tell you all this stuff, but really developing scientists within their communities and uh, so that they can become advocates for science. So I think there, that's definitely, I think that after the pandemic, there has been a realization of how, um, the disconnect between, you know, what scientists think 
that people know about science versus the reality. And so an understanding that, yeah, we have, as scientists, we have to be part of our communities. Um, and so the, there are programs that are now being developed, but I think, yeah, everyone should be a part of that conversation because it's really important now. Uh, yeah, and I'll just add and say, you know, this notion of everyone is a scientist is not always very helpful because then you just then you can make up your own hypothesis and suddenly that's true and that's what we see happening around right and this is why this type of education i think is so valuable as an introductory course right because the students spend an entire year doing this right and at the end of it they actually publish a short manuscript and when they're doing this i mean every sentence counts how you phrase it, the instructor's like, that's, that's too ambiguous. No one's gonna understand that. Well, is that true? Can we stand behind it? And so when they leave that classroom, they understand what it means to look at what something that science says, right? We always say we're 98% confident in it. For them, it means you don't know what you're talking about. It could be something else, right? But we understand what it means. And it's really hard to teach someone that, right? It's something you experience and then understand. And so, I think, you know, as an introductory course, it could have profound effect. And I think um, place more students, more scientists in communities. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming all that way. <clears throat> it's great to have you here, really enjoyed it. Anecdotally, Biology 101, you got the aspiring scientists sitting up front and everybody else in the back who's just fulfilling a science requirement. So what is your, does this hold for both groups or does that change your methodology? How do you approach that when you have vastly different levels of motivation? Thank you. I don't know, I teach non-majors. So every student at the beginning of the year, I do a survey, why are you in this class? And they all say, I have to take this class. I don't like science. Science has no impact on my life. So every single student, and I don't want them to change like, oh, you have to be a scientist. Because I think we need historians, we need. Um, but I, my goal always when I teach is to understand how science can be useful to you and can be empowering, uh, both to help you make decisions about you know, your health or the health of our planet, but also from, to protect you from a lot of bad information. So I try to connect, and that's why the two-way communication is really important, because I have to understand what students are interested in, um, what motivates them. So that's why you need, to, you need to know your students as an educator. You need to have conversations, see what questions they have, and then try to connect science. Right now we're not, and I think it's important also for students who want to pursue science. Uh, if you don't see the connections and it's just, you know, you have to memorize all these facts, uh, even the most motivated students might need, lose interest. Do you have? Yeah, there's, a, there's another component that you get from this form of education that I think can can change how a student experiences the classroom. And so we know that you know, in, in the US, these small colleges are called community colleges um, because they serve local students. They're two-year colleges. Usually they're using it as a stepping stone. Um, they're called community colleges, but usually they are commuter students. They're driving in and out. There's no real community like a four-year institution. And our instructors tell us that through an experience like this, where they're doing research collaboratively, it's the first time that their students have community in higher education. And so I think the, yeah, the benefits are, are broad, regardless of who the students are. So, yeah, for the same time, is that the thing, the inspirational lectures get the both big and far. 